Dead bodies will continue to be transformed into the flesh-eating ghouls. Hello and welcome back to Pathophysiology of the Living Dead, the OK Cupid for Science and Zombies. It's been a while since I recorded my last episode, like four months, but, you know, I I'm still trying to get them out, life got busy, whatever. As um, soon as I record them, I'll put them out, as soon as I have time to record them, I'll record them. So, today we're going to be talking about retroviruses and, and the how they become proviruses and what a provirus is. So. Retroviruses are a very interesting and, and, and groovy type of virus. And it's even possible that the, the virus we saw in Season 1 of The Walking Dead was a retrovirus. Uh, I, I talked about it in Episode 9, but from the, the structure that we saw, generally that's not the same structure of most, well, what we've seen in, in most retroviruses. So... Uh, retroviruses, viruses in this category are the African green monkey simian foamy virus. I'm not making this shit up. You probably haven't heard of, but you probably have heard of HIV. It's a retrovirus. Retroviruses are usually enveloped, positive sense, single-stranded RNA viruses that carry an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. The term retro in retrovirus Groovy, baby! That was probably the worst Austin Powers impression anybody's ever heard. Refers to the reverse method of gene transcription. Generally in viruses, DNA is transcribed into RNA and RNA to proteins. In a retrovirus, with the help of the reverse transcriptase enzyme, RNA is transcribed into DNA. The DNA then becomes a provirus, and I'll talk about this in, in just a second. The, the DNA then is transcribed back into RNA, and RNA is translated into proteins. Now let's go back to where the retrovirus becomes a provirus. This is the whole reason I wanted to do this episode separately from the last episode where we talked about viruses in general. The provirus is really cool and, and actually really creepy when when you think about it and I'm gonna make you think about the creepy side of it of course so after the RNA is transcribed into DNA with that help of reverse transcriptase the another enzyme that the virus carries called integrase kudos to whoever makes up these names because easy as heck to remember what they do it integrates itself into the host cell genome. It what? The viral DNA inserts itself at random into your DNA. Here's a great animation. So here we're looking inside the nucleus of a cell, and this here is the cellular DNA. Uh, coming up in purple is the DNA that was transcribed from the viral RNA. So this is the viral code. This little yellow glob on the end is the integrase. So as you can see here, it comes up to the DNA of the cell and inserts itself right into it. It is now part of your own genetic code. The virus is now a part of you. It will be with you forever. It changes your DNA. <gasps> now at this point, the virus can either activate and produce bits and pieces it needs for its own replication, as we saw in episode 10. If you didn't watch that one, I recommend going back to it. Or it can lay dormant, waiting for a change in the host cell's environment or the body's environment to activate. If it lays dormant, as the cell divides, normal cell division makes a copy of its DNA with that chunk of the uh, genetic code for the provirus. They can even infect germ cells which are involved in sexual reproduction and be carried on to your children and their children and so on. At this point they are now referred to as endogenous retroviruses. In fact it's estimated that about five to eight percent of our DNA is made up out of these endogenous retroviruses. It's even opened up 
a new area of study called paleovirology, the study of viral fossils, if you will. While the DNA transcribed from a retrovirus is randomly inserted into our own DNA, it's not far off to believe that there is a chance it can be inserted into just the right spot to create a mutation of a specific cell. Creating insertional mutagenesis or a virus-induced malignant transformation. Maybe it's even possible that they can activate and mutate an endogenous retrovirus by being inserted in just the right spot. I don't see why that can't happen. I'm not a virologist, but maybe somebody out there is and they can uh, say yay or nay. But if we have a latent provirus that has changed our DNA and over time our body is replicating more and more of these mutated target cells to the point where the majority or a large number of those target cells are now mutated, well, I think the possibilities are endless. And if you think that's a little too far-fetched, you should Google search the term viral vectors. See what that brings up. Creepy. So that's it for episode 11 of Pathophysiology of the Living Dead, or POTLID. I didn't give it that name. But, you know, like I said, I, busy, busy, busy. Um, I love recording, I love researching this, it's just I don't have the time to devote it to a schedule yet. Um, everything's pretty much up in the air, pretty wacky right now. But I'll put them out as soon as I have time. So you can either subscribe to YouTube, that's, uh, I don't know, YouTube slash P-O-T-L-D. Uh, you sus subscribe to the blog, that's P-O-T-L-D dot com. Or you can follow me on Twitter. I don't tweet a lot. Uh, I don't tweet a lot about zombies and science, but whenever I do have a new episode out, I am sure to tweet it. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's at Spooky Bill. As always, thank you for watching. Leave your comments below here on YouTube or here on the blog, wherever you're watching this. And remember to stay spooky. And mutate an erogenous, detrogenous.